Bonjour tout le monde, welcome to this third session of Emergence, which uh, will focus on the COVID-19's implications for First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities in Canada. Je tiens tout d'abord euh, à reconnaître que les bureaux de la Fondation se trouvent sur le territoire traditionnel du peuple Mohawk, un endroit qui sert depuis longtemps aux échanges entre diverses nations. Je les remercie chaleureusement de nous accueillir dans un esprit de réconciliation aujourd'hui. Miigwech, Miawen, Marcy. Alors, permettez-moi de prendre quelques instants euh, pour souligner le ferme engagement de la Fondation pierre et Trudeau à contribuer au processus de réconciliation entre le Canada et les peuples autochtones et aux appels à l'action de la Commission de vérité et réconciliation du Canada. Cet engagement se traduit de plusieurs manières. First, our new strategic plan is committed to the inclusion of different forms of knowledge in its leadership training program, including Indigenous knowledge. In that spirit, members of our community spent a day-long visit to Deshenta in the Northwest Territories last year, where learning from the land provided an enriching and transformative experience. De plus, la Fondation encourage activement et veille à assurer la représentation des membres des Premières Nations et des communautés inuites et métisses au sein de ces cohortes de boursiers, boursières, fellows et mentors. Since 2019, we welcomed a record number of First Nations, Inuit and Métis scholars in our community, and we are very proud uh, to take this direction. Moreover, in responding to one of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Foundation recently adopted the policy on bilingualism plus, which encourages all scholars to learn Indigenous languages in addition to the official languages of Canada, French and English. Alors, encore une fois, nous sommes très fiers uh, d'innover dans ce domaine et de répondre aux appels à la réconciliation. Enfin, par des activités comme celle d'aujourd'hui, la Fondation favorise l'éducation publique et la réflexion sur les réalités et les défis des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis à travers le Canada. Je remercie chaleureusement tous les participants et participantes euh, qui nous font cadeau de leur temps, de leur talent, de leur sagesse aujourd'hui. Thank you for making this time. It means a lot to the Foundation. And I am uh, really privileged uh, to welcome uh, Mimi Laville Harvard, uh, who was the first ever Indigenous scholar part of the, of the Foundation uh, cohort 2003. It is such a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you uh, for moderating this panel today. Merci. You're very welcome. And I want to say what an honor it is to be here with everyone today. Ani, Bojo. Sego, Segoli, Skanagoa, Wabnimi Dijnikas, Wikwem Kong, Donjaba. I shared with you my traditional name is Wabnimi, which means white dove in my traditional Odawa language. And I'm from the Wikwemakong First Nation on Manitoulin Island. And as mentioned, I was very honored to be one of that first cohort of the Trudeau scholars and have a very special spot in my heart for all of my fellow scholars as we you know, began that journey, what now seems like so long ago. And as we just, you know, today, thinking about how important it is to have this conversation as we just came through yesterday's festivities, you know, in a very different way that because of the COVID crisis, the muted celebrations, and yet it brings to mind the question of, you know, what does celebrating the creation of Canada mean for Indigenous peoples? And it almost seemed like yesterday's different kind of celebration was much more in line with how Indigenous peoples are feeling. When we celebrate the creation of Canada, we often, in fact, make a point of acknowledging that Canada has been here. We have been here for much longer than 150 years. Um, it's much more like 10,150. And, you know, we really want to celebrate the true long-standing history of Canada in this country. And so as part of that celebration and acknowledging of who we are as Canada, you know, moving into this really important conversation today. As recognized by Dr. Theresa Tam, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, our First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities across the country are among the most vulnerable to COVID-19 due to the long-standing social inequities. Many of our communities living in third world conditions in the middle of one of the richest countries in the world 
living with a lack of access to basic health care services, clean water, housing, hydro. Many of our rural communities and remote First Nations have overcrowded living conditions. And the higher rates of problematic health conditions, the overrepresentation of our people with pre existing conditions and poorer health, means that First Nations, Metis, and Inuit people are, in fact, much more vulnerable to this crisis, this pandemic. And calls into question our one size fits all recommendations that have come from public health authorities which may be very difficult or in fact impossible to implement in remote, rural, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. So it's in this context, and as provinces are undergoing progressive deconfinement, as we're beginning to reopen, some First Nations communities across the country have put in place road checks or blockades over the roads and other gateways to their territory in order to avoid the spread of the virus into their community. My own First Nation on Manitoulin Island put up a blockade and did not allow anybody, even band members, in or out. Once you were in, you had to stay in. Members were not even allowed to leave the community to go for groceries. And while we understand, we have to recognize the singular importance that when we're talking about the preservation of our language, our history, and our culture, in communities where sometimes we have only a handful of Indigenous elders who still speak the language, even one COVID death among our elders wipes out a vast knowledge of our history and the potential for us to reclaim our language when we lose even one of those elders. So that's why it was so important to lock down our communities in this way, even though it seemed extreme, even to many community members who objected to having their liberty limited in this way. And that's why it's important that we're having this conversation today and I would like to introduce our panelists who are going to be discussing the intricacies, subtleties, and complexities of the COVID situation and the response to the pandemic for Indigenous communities. We have with us the Honourable Patty Labucane Benson, who is a scholar from 2004. She is the author of The Outside Circle. Based on her doctoral studies, the graphic novel tells the story of colonization, historic trauma, healing, and reconciliation through the lens of an impoverished Cree family from Edmonton's inner city. Dr. Labukane Benson is a national and international lecturer and trainer in areas including historic trauma-informed service delivery, as well as the transformation of child welfare and correctional services into spaces that build individual, family, and community resilience. We are also very honored to have with us today the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell, as the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Ms. Dowdswell is committed to reconciliation and attempts to engage frequently with representatives of Indigenous communities by honouring the Crown's foundational relationship with them, ensuring Indigenous representation at events wherever possible, several of which I have had the honour of joining, and creating opportunities for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to come together in dialogue, dialogue such as this. We also have with us Jamie Snook, scholar from 2017. 2017 scholar and commentator, Jamie is an advocate for self-determination in all aspects of Indigenous life, including locally led research. The global pandemic has provided the opportunity to witness how Indigenous communities have exerted leadership and sovereignty by creating locally appropriate and culturally relevant responses to COVID-19. Through examples from Inuit, Nungat, the Inuit homelands, particularly from his home in Labrador, Jamie will highlight the ways in which Inuit have developed strength-based approaches to support community health and well-being based in science and evidence, yet grounded in Indigenous culture values in lands and waters. So as we start off our conversation, I would like to address the first question to the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell, after yesterday's celebrations, after all of the conversations about racism globally, in the middle of this pandemic, I'd like to ask why is the Lieutenant, is the Lieutenant Governor interested in this particular conversation at this particular juncture in time?
we go. You'd think after all these Zoom calls, I'd have it down to a science now, but uh, thank you very much. And it's, it's wonderful to be back with the uh, Trudeau Foundation family. I, I join you today with a, with a good deal of humility. I'm not Indigenous, and many of the people involved today are. Although as an immigrant, I do know something about the search for belonging and the search for identity. But I say very openly that my knowledge and understanding remain very much a, a work in progress. And I have an amazing platform for which to learn. But I'm also convinced that this is a conversation that all Canadians need to have. This is not simply an Indigenous matter or issue. It's an issue for all of us. I, uh, I start by acknowledging that, uh, that I am on land uh, of the Mississaugas of the uh, Credit First Nation. And I do that because uh, it's not only a sign of respect, uh, but it also allows me to say that we have an opportunity to take inspiration from the spirit of kinship and mutual obligation of treaty making. I, um, I've had uh, the opportunity over almost six years to be so generously welcomed into Indigenous communities, such a wide variety, spending time with um, uh, literacy camps for children in uh, fly-in nations in the north, the opportunity to attend cultural arts and sports event, the opportunity to take uh, uh, through patronage uh, the, uh, the knowledge of uh, indigenous architects to the world community, for example, uh, it, with, with such pride. Um, I'm, I'm an honorary ranger, uh, which allows me to attend training sessions and to be with, with young indigenous people looking to protect their nations in the north. I've seen firsthand just uh, wonderful examples of um, the way in which uh, some indigenous nations are developing uh, access to amazing health care. The Mesmewe um, Community Health Center in Timmins, for example, uh, the Moose Cree Assisted Living for Elders Center. There are wonderful stories to be told, as well as, of course, the ones that are not so wonderful. And I, I can, uh, I can uh, tell you stories at length, but we don't have time to do that today, much as I'd like to. But to answer your question, I think one of the things that a Lieutenant Governor can do, uh, and one of the few opportunities that a Lieutenant Governor has is the opportunity to convene, to convene for dialogue, respectful dialogue in safe spaces for conversation. Um, I can, with Indigenous people, simply bear witness, and, and that is what I do by my attendance at many ceremonies, uh, but I can also shine a light, both on issues of concern, but also on uh, wonderful examples of how the traditional way of knowing can be so important for the rest of Canadian citizens as well. So it's an amazing platform. And, uh, and I think the opportunity to tell stories, to, uh, to uh, begin to create empathy uh, with people and to develop relationships um, is one of the most important roles that a Lieutenant Governor can play. And uh, so that's, that's why I'm happy to be part of talking about what, I, what I'm observing uh, as we go through this pandemic. So now that, thank you so much for those words. I think you've mentioned something really important in your words about the opportunity to convene for dialogue and why this dialogue is so important. And you've had this opportunity to visit Indigenous communities across the province that maybe most people in Canada would never have. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you could share with us what you've had the opportunity to see during this time of global pandemic. What, what have you seen that has been happening in Indigenous communities and First Nations making Inuit communities that you have been visiting and working with? Thanks very much. Um, great. 
Um, one of the wonderful privileges that I've had as I, over the last four months, have made this transition from external in-person events to learning to operate in a digital world, virtually. Um, I have had the opportunity to reach out to uh, hundreds of leaders across Ontario. In some cases, these are municipal leaders, they're uh, people who manage hospitals, people who head up uh, uh, women's shelters, um, and I've had the opportunity to talk in private with a number of chiefs, uh, a number of um, people who manage uh, uh, Indigenous institutions related to education, related to health, and, uh, and also uh, related to um, uh, business opportunities. These, uh, I've been doing this um, because people don't often reach out to leaders. You know, leaders are supposed to be superhuman, I guess. And so my conversations, mm -hmm. because they are private uh, and not attributable to anyone, allow me to say, so how are you doing? Uh, how are you personally managing in these times? Often to people who don't have an opportunity to talk to anybody without it becoming a political issue. And that's been absolutely fascinating. So what I thought that you might be interested in is, uh, is just a couple of the overarching observations that I would make without attributing them to anyone. And I think what you'll find is that you're not surprised uh, by what I hear. Um, the stories that, I, that I've heard are absolutely poignant. Some of them are full of grief, of course. And in many ways, uh, it is quite wonderful to hear that many Indigenous communities have been able to protect themselves from the deaths that, are, that have been celebrated, that have been uh, commemorated in other parts of, of, the, uh, of the province. So there are wonderful stories, very hard to listen to, but there are amazing stories hopeful stories of creativity, of courage, of community spirit. And I heard those particularly from Indigenous leaders. The other thing that, uh, that I heard was um, collab about collaboration. Um, the, uh, virtually everyone commented on this welcome lack of partisanship. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, in Ontario, they, the Indigenous leaders in particular have spoken about uh, their partnership with the provincial government, and that's the way they, they frame it. Now, these are not all Pollyanna statements, but they come consistently uh, about, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if all levels of government, all orders of government, uh, actually uh, maintained that same sense of collaboration mm -hmm. going forward? And the second very positive thing that I kept hearing was a commitment to community and to caring. Uh, as you suggested yourself, Madam Moderator, uh, the, even to the extent of restricting access to the community, which was very difficult for some of them to go through. But they took time to tell me about the mechanisms they put in place within their own communities uh, and, and stories of what actually worked. Uh, and, and that was so important to hear, and they were so proud of what they were able to do. I said that there weren't many surprises, uh, and I think in many ways I would describe the pandemic as really becoming a, a punctuation point. Uh, because as I go through the list, some of which you've talked about, um, I think there are a number of things, and we hear them all the time. So it's not as if we don't know. But the pandemic uh, forced into very stark relief. It exposed all of the vulnerabilities, the inequities, the systemic racism, poverty. And they, in my mind, asked the question, who is it and what do we actually value? Uh, what is mm -hmm. essential in this country? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and are we really going to address that? The immediate questions uh, that I heard about were issues of lack of capacity. How can you social distance when you've, uh, when you've got overcrowded facilities? 
clean water, access to health services. I also heard a cry for the urgent need for uh, data and statistics. And in fact, some leaders said to me, um, the number of cases we're having are actually lower than we expected to have. And is that really accurate? Do we actually have the statistics and the data that we need to take the next steps? I also heard people uh, talking about their concern about urban Indigenous people, uh, particularly issues of unemployment and homelessness. Um, I heard worry about those outside the territory who would happen to be in prison and in the justice system, places where they're almost in pressure cooker situations uh, and the outcome is expected to be problematic. Of course, I heard about continued violence against women and again, how difficult that is when there's no place to go. And in the longer term, of course, mental health and addiction, uh, that comes up. And I, I might say that that is, is not at all um, related only to uh, indigenous nations. That's a comment mm -hmm. I hear right across, uh, across the province. I hear, people referring to their concern in the, uh, in the medium term, uh, if not longer term, about the impact of uh, the way in which children are being educated and how we may be left with a lost generation. Um, and then of course, uh, whether or not there's going to be a, a dignified work for people as well. And then people turn to um, what next? And so the concerns certainly in the last couple of weeks uh, have changed and they now are about how to re-enter, how to recover safely, how to actually make sure that we are prepared for the next wave. It may not be right across the country, it may be in certain areas, but surely we've learned something from this first wave that should prepare us for the second wave. And in the longer term, how on earth are we going to up our game so that we can deal with future pandemics, but also future crises? And of course, uh, the overriding one in the future is, if not the present, is uh, climate change. And so people, particularly indigenous leaders, have been relating uh, this crisis to the one that is before us with climate change. I would make two additional uh, and concluding observations. Um, one is that sustainability, which is so inherently understood by Indigenous people, is actually a very good framework for the path forward. Um, I've mentioned that ways of knowing of uh, Indigenous people can teach us so much about the relationship with the environment and a path to resilience. Uh, in fact, I heard uh, a, a couple of uh, Indigenous leaders in particular talk about the fact that Indigenous people are resilient. And, uh, and in fact, they may come through the actual pandemic itself in better shape uh, than many others in the, in the province. So I was, I was struck by an overwhelming sense of hope, not of despair. Certainly we talked about the issues, but they, those are the issues that we've heard all the time. And if there's one thing that I would say, it's that, um, uh, that we don't need to take a lot of time talking about further action, that we really have uh, so many reports before us, so many recommendations, uh, that getting to work acting on those recommendations is, is what we need to do. I would like to think that moving forward, we won't simply drift unthinkingly into some form of normalcy, that we have a, a collective amnesia about what we've learned as we've gone through this. I, uh, I rather hope that we'll be energized to actually uh, use this moment to design a better normal, not even a new normal, but uh, a better normal. And I think genuine dialogue, action will do that um, and I would hope that we can find a way of building on the solidarity that I've seen and with genuine respect for the other.
Thank you so much. I think, I mean, there's so much, so many things in what you've said that I want to pick up on. Um, but I, I recognize wanting to make sure that we have enough time for everybody to comment on these. If we can ask uh, Senator Labucane Benson to pick up on these notions of solidarity, on the lack of partisanship that we have seen Ontario, we have seen our nation in a place where all levels of government, from the municipality, from the chief and council, to the province, to the federal government, you know, have set aside those partisanship debates to really put the needs of, of our, our most vulnerable citizens at the forefront. And so maybe if our Senator Labucane Benson can discuss from your perspective, picking up on this notion of solidarity and lack of partisanship, has Canada's various jurisdictions has the unique needs of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit populations um, been heard by the various levels of government? Have they been responding appropriately to the concerns, requests, and, and demands that are coming from the local grassroots First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities? Mm. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start by saying I'm a Métis Ukrainian. I grew up on Treaty 6 territory and I still live on Treaty 6 territory, and that today I'm on, right on the West Bank First Nation territory in uh, or around Kelowna, so I'm happy to be here. I know that we have one minute left, and if I keep talking, Jamie will not get a chance to talk. Um, you have lots of time. We can take what you need. Okay, uh, so I guess for me, the idea of solidarity, I want to focus on the interconnectedness and solidarity of Indigenous people that I've seen. Um, in Alberta, I have seen um, people mobilizing their resilience, you know, and an, a resilience that comes from a deep sense of interconnectedness, what the Cree elders out here would call our wahotuan, our, our deep kinship with all living things. And, um, you know, so I saw this interconnectedness being mobilized to close borders and protect elders. Um, as a senator, I've been involved in this um, very high-level conversation around long-term care and the way in which uh, seniors in the Canadian society are cared for or maybe not cared for at times. Mm -hmm. And yet we saw in uh, First Nations, Métis communities here in Alberta, an immediate response to care for elders. Um, I, I, there was this intergenerational transmission of knowledge of pandemics and disease that was passed down over generations. When this was first being discussed, um, the leaders out here, they believed it immediately and they acted immediately. Still, while the rest of Canada was humming and hawing about, is this really a pandemic? Is it going to be that bad? I saw leaders taking immediate action because they knew these stories exist in community and they acted immediately. Um, at the beginning, there was no PPE available in communities and you know, delivering food to elders, doing that kind of thing, the, the community needed PPE. And I saw organizations and communities sharing, you know, whoever had them. I, knew, I know um, the organization I used to work for, Native Counseling Services of Alberta, uh, clients were making homemade masks and we were making them available to nations that needed them at the beginning before non-medical masks were made available to people. Um, most importantly, though, the discussion around ceremonies has been critical. Mm -hmm. um, the community that I'm involved, uh, ceremonial community I'm in, uh, the elders were talking about fasting and Sundance, which this is, this is ceremony season. Summer is the time that we go out and we pray for our people and we, we get very focused on, you know, the spiritual health of our people and not the idea of not having Sundance and not having the fast and not um, uh, strengthening ourselves spiritually was, was uh, an important conversation. And elders were in this very interesting position of the exact thing that they have to offer to help their people is the thing that they were being told not to do because of social distancing and the capacity you know, to get to ceremony and, and be there in a healthy way. And I'm really happy to say these ceremonies still went on. They went on in a mindful way that we were in the middle of a pandemic, but the elders were still able to offer 
to the people that which they they needed to um, to to offer ceremonies that actually were responsible for the resilience, the sense of identity, the interconnectedness that helped Indigenous people survive colonization and to con continue to survive colonization. Those things were still going on. So um, this deep interconnectedness in the community is what helped people to survive the, the first wave of this pandemic quite successfully. I would say First Nations and Métis people have survived it better than other Canadians. We could learn from them. The only thing I do want to talk about interconnectedness from the perspective of internet service is a major issue in our communities. I have been, you know, in Alberta, we have land-based Métis people, the settlements, and many of those settlements are in places where there's poor internet and there's poor cell phone service. And I have been talking with leadership out there. And it's important because while we all started working from home on Zoom, um, we all got set up with our headsets and, you know, the Senate has been doing its work on committees over Zoom. Um, Métis children haven't been able to go to school this whole time. They don't have an internet connection that would survive um, or is, is strong enough to be able to go to school. Not all Métis children, but some, some land-based uh, settlements, they were having a heck of a time with internet. Remote First Nations don't have good internet service. When the whole world went online and we were moaning and complaining about eight hours of Zoom a day, there were communities that would have, would have done anything to get online. And I think that, um, I know the government rolled out uh, $500 million in the first wave of helping people get more connected, but I would say going forward, we're all saying this is the new normal, this is how we're going to be communicating. We need to make sure that rural communities, certainly indigenous remote communities are not left behind because mm -hmm. they're not enjoying, if that's the right word, this, <laughs> this ability to communicate online. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think you've raised something really important here, this notion of staying connected. And we need to remember, as you've pointed out, that the lack of reliable broadband is not simply a remote community issue. We have communities here, First Nations like Curve Lake, that are 10, 15 minutes outside of Peterborough that don't have reliable internet for their children. Um, I have to admit my own children were quite pleased about that as they were trying to avoid completing their studies, but you know, that, that's a privilege to be able to, to have. Um, I wanted to say that we are currently experiencing what my grandfather explained. You know, some people have this notion of Indian time or Indigenous time being that we're running late on everything. Um, but actually what our elders always said is that it's not that we're late, it's that things get done when they need to be done and things take as long as they need to take. And that's why it's important that we are going to continue this conversation to make sure everybody has their opportunity to make those important points. Um, I personally feel that we could carry this conversation on for the next several hours, but I won't keep everybody that long. Um, but we will certainly add about another 20 minutes here to make sure everybody has time. Is This is such an important topic and we could carry on. I wanted to, you know, further the conversation when we're talking about connectivity, when we're talking about the... Um, the long-term impacts that's going to have, I know well, both of our speakers have already brought up the issues of the long-term mental health impacts that this COVID pandemic is going to have, not only on the elderly who are isolated, but also on those younger generations who are similarly isolated at a time when it's absolutely mm -hmm. critical to their development. So I would actually invite any of our, our panelists and our, our commentator to if you had any comments you wanted to make on what you see, you know, as we're emerging from this or, or potentially when we're talking about what a new and better normal, what that new normal is going to be like um, with regard to potential long-term impacts. Well, um, I will say that this uh, using Zoom, and I'll use the Senate as an example, uh, Certainly we're getting work done. We're doing our oversight work and we're looking at, you know, the pandemic response in committee. But I think the Senate suffers 
when we are not interconnected, when we do not have face-to-face -face meetings. The Confederation requires us to talk to each other, to learn from each other. The only way to find the common ground to move forward as a government is through relationships. And there's no, you know, the elders have said that there's no um, uh, substitute for face-to-face. I would say it's exactly the same in our communities. You know, when, when children and elders are not spending time together, other than if they are in the same um, house, uh, we're suffering. The, I think that we suffer when we are not able to, um, to build relationships face-to-face -to, -face to understand where the other person is coming from. And even though I think we've done a valiant effort to try to stay connected, nations and organizations in Alberta, over the long term, we're going to suffer if we don't have an opportunity to meet face to face and to talk through um, to talk through the challenges in front of us. Thank you. I think that's so important. Um, would our honorable Lieutenant Governor like to comment on this? Well, you you just remind me of of one of the the most the saddest stories I heard was from a leader of an organization who uh, who uh, told me that she had to break all of the rules because of her 13 year old daughter who was so suffering mm -hmm. from not being able to connect. And even though, uh, and, and she was in a position of authority, she was in a, uh, a position of a certain amount of status and she just said, I just had to break the rules for my 13 year old. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Those really, really very heartfelt stories and a lot of them relate. I don't think we really fully understand the impact of isolation. Uh, for children, certainly I worry about them, uh, but, uh, but I worry about uh, our elders as well who uh, who uh, are are being have the feeling they're being left alone and i do think that uh, finding some way to to ease that uh, ease into uh, much more connectedness that we have right now is absolutely crucial mm -hmm. thank you and um, jamie did you want to comment on this all important question of the long term mental health yeah, no, I, uh, I just thought of an interesting story myself and in that uh, it's not uh, right to necessarily assume that education uh, stopped happening uh, with the pandemic because uh, I know in our region in Labrador, a lot of people took to the land. It was spring mm -hmm. season, it was seal hunting season, and uh, there's a beautiful story that was told on the current last week uh, by a family from Rigolette who uh, many youth had uh, harvested their first seal this spring because they weren't in school. So uh, I think it was important for us to acknowledge that aspect of it as well. That uh, there was certainly uh, a lot of time spent on the land in this region, and I'm sure right across Canada. So we can take that into account when we consider education, but also mental health and, and wellness for sure. Thank you so much. I think that. It's a really good point is that our young people are having a very different kind of education. I mean, mind joke about graduating from Google High School, but it's, our families are having a different kind of learning right now. And, and many families are, are actually able to embrace um, spending some time together in ways that this forced slowdown has made us recognize what's important, as we said, what's really essential in our lives, and also actually having, being forced to spend that time with our families in a way that we haven't, that we've always longed for, but haven't had the opportunity. I'd like to turn over at this point for our, our commentator to help pull together all of these threads that have, have come from these comments, uh, talking about the decision making at the various levels of government, how that is during a pandemic, how that has impacted our communities, um, what's you know happening right from the the family level through the leadership level to you know leadership at the municipal, provincial, or federal level. 
and how you see that this relationship between the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples of Turtle Island with Canada as a, as a larger society, um, how that's going to emerge from this pandemic. What, so just some thoughts on any, any aspect of that. Yeah, no, I realized that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, thank you. And I'm uh, sure we can all acknowledge it's a very complex uh, question to, uh, to summarize, but uh, I wanted to uh, thank all of you for all of the great work you've done in advancing Indigenous health and well-being and, uh, and uh, certainly appreciate it going through all of the bios of the panelists and yourself. Uh, and I just wanted to situate my, myself as well. I was uh, born and raised in, in Labrador on the southeast coast in the southern Inuit territory of Nunatukavut. And, and I am a proud member of the Nunatukavut uh, community, community Council. Uh, and I was born in a small coastal community that I wanted to show everyone uh, behind me today because I, I am proud to be uh, from a small place, less than 400 people. Uh, and when the pandemic uh, came evident, and as a researcher, a lot of us were uh, wondering uh, how were we going to get into communities and stuff like that. And uh, we quickly realized that that was the least of uh, people's worry in community. Uh, and I felt uh, it was very heartening and empowering to see indigenous organizations, in this case, the Nunatukavu Community Council, uh, respond the way that they did, uh, which was quicker, it was more cautious, uh, it was more culturally appropriate, mm -hmm. uh, and guidelines were quickly put in place for researchers. Uh, programs were put in place, such as delivering firewood to elders, harvester support programs, uh, one mask per person project where local sewers got together. It was a whole uh, realm of actions that show that indigenous people uh, will and can take care of their own. And our own history in Labrador has shown through things like the Spanish flu and other health crisis like tuberculosis and high suicide rates that we really can't depend on anyone else when it comes right down to it. I mean, there needs to be that level of self-determination. And I, I felt really uh, uplifted to see that happen to a greater extent this time. Without the indigenous governments in place that are in place today, uh, I think the COVID-19 response in Labrador would have been dramatically different. We could have seen history repeat itself. So. Uh, I take some comfort in that and uh, I think for this discussion and sort of bridging a little bit with the French panel as well, it's important to highlight the diversity of experiences uh, right now and how different people are experiencing COVID-19. I mean, we often refer to First Nations, Inuit and Métis as, as if there's just that uh, three three groups was very diverse and within that we have people that identify as male female non-binary gender mm -hmm. fluid um, we have status and non-status people with land claims people without land claims we have people in urban versus rural and remote so everyone's experiencing this pandemic uh, very very different and I also think one of the big things that came through is, is while we've been watching all of these COVID-19 uh, statistics and advice, things like social isolation and physical distancing and, and washing hands are, are certainly forms of privilege in a, a lot of indigenous communities simply don't have that access. So mm -hmm. uh, it just highlights the need for place-based uh, and very specific policies. Like one size does not necessarily fit all. And I, I think it's good to, uh, to bring that out. And uh, I guess also acknowledging we're on a short time, I would just say for the scholars and others when they reconvene with your thoughts from the webinar. I think it's important to 
think more deeply and critically about the, the diversity of Indigenous experiences, uh, about, about self-determination during this pandemic, and about Indigenous rights and health. I know Indigenous people in the nation are, are clearly uh, telling the state uh, what they need. And while Canada has gotten uh, better, I guess, at listening, uh, are, not, are, are, are they really being heard, I guess? And, and is action really being taken? And I think we need to start differentiating between convening dialogues and, and all of the safe space that's created is, is positive. But at the end of the day, there needs to be action taken and money and resources got to be put to these very serious issues. I mean, the, like there's going to be more pandemics to come. And I guess my only final comment is as engaged leaders uh, that are uh, being put through the Trudeau Foundation, uh, Indigenous peoples uh, do need allies. I mean, we can't uh, do this uh, alone. The work can't be done. It's it's not going to happen alone in Canada the way we're structured right now. Uh, but I certainly encourage people to uh, understand that policies can't be made in isolation of the people that are going to be impacted. So if you're doing research mm -hmm. or if you want to have views on Indigenous health and well-being, whatever you do, make sure uh, they're involved. Uh, so I would leave that uh, with the uh, scholars to take away. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. And I think that's really important to remember, you know, this, this notion of nothing about us without us, that you know, our communities, those people who are living on the land, living in the communities, we need to make sure that we're uh, creating those opportunities for dialogue. And as, as we wrap up this session, I want to share with you a small example of the resilience of our Indigenous elders. When my mother, who is in her 80s, or almost in her 80s, and my children ended up on opposite sides of the barricade when our First Nation closed down. And, you know, we were told the rules of the province that unless you, you weren't allowed to be in contact with anybody outside of your own home, anybody who didn't live in your home. And so she called me one day and she said she had found a solution. And lo and behold, not long after, my mother showed up at my door with her suitcases, three dogs, a couple of cats, and said, we live with you now. And she, <laughs> So I now have six dogs in my house, seven cats, and absolute chaos, but everybody is happy. The kids have been learning how to cook traditional foods. They've been harvesting medicines and, you know, learning that they would never have got in the school. And this is a time that they will never forget that they were able to spend this time together. And so it really has made us realize uh, all our relations, what's important to us as, as human beings, as indigenous people and as societies around the world, we've really now come to realize that that relationship is the most fundamentally important part and all the rest of it becomes non-essential when push comes to shove in this situation. So I think at this point, I know we have gone over, we need to wrap this up. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here with us today to offering your insights and your wisdom and your experience and perspectives. I think, as you've mentioned, that all of us at every level of government, at every level of society, at every level of the community need to be engaged in improving the circumstances for Indigenous peoples across this country if we are going to see Canada as a society that is, is just and equitable, everybody needs to be part of that work. And today's session was one small part of that, I hope. So at this point, I would like to turn it back over to Pascal for any final comments you need. Yes, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Uh, it has been a very rich uh, session in French and in English. Uh, we are learning from all of you. Uh, I like uh, the closing remarks from Jamie and, and Mimi that we're in this together and we have uh, to uh, walk in the same direction, which is the direction of reconciliation. So this involves deep listening. It also involves actions. 
so thank you for, uh, for being here with us. Alors, merci à tout le monde. Uh, ça a été une, vraiment une session extraordinaire. À bientôt. Uh, bienvenue tout le monde à nos discussions sur notre émergence de la crise de COVID. Je vous joigne de la territoire de trois Premières Nations, le Huron-Wendat, les Odonchani et les Mississauga de New Credit First Nation. Uh, on parle du relancement d'un monde qui sera d'une manière ou d'une autre très changé. La pandémie est arrivée au Canada immédiatement à la suite d'une crise, on dirait, et d'une nouvelle brisure dans les relations entre le Canada et les communautés autochtones qui vivent ici depuis des temps immémoriaux. Un blocus de chemin de rail pour donner appui aux communautés qui résistaient à un gazoduc en Colombie-Britannique, comme vous savez. Question profonde alors sur l'avenir de la réconciliation. Ensuite, la pandémie, qui menaçait particulièrement les communautés autochtones à cause d'un système de santé déjà en crise et des conditions de vie dangereuses dans plusieurs communautés. Par contre, on commence à apprendre comment plusieurs nations autochtones ont mieux géré les menaces de COVID que leurs voisins canadiens. En Colombie-Britannique, par exemple, les communautés de Premières Nations montrent un taux d'infection beaucoup plus petit que dans la population générale. Et au nord de l'Ontario, les chercheurs à la Renton University en Sudbury étudient comment les Premières Nations protègent leurs communautés en faisant une synthèse des data de santé, de santé publique et des traditions orales des épidémies qui leur ont déjà touchées. Histoire à la fois de vulnérabilité particulière créée par un racisme systémique enraciné dans l'histoire canadienne et de leadership particulier dans les communautés autochtones dont on devrait tout apprendre. Durant les prochaines 25 minutes, on a le grand honneur d'en discuter avec Sophie Thériot. Bonjour Sophie. Sophie est professeure agrégée à la section de droit civil de l'Université d'Ottawa, où elle enseigne notamment le droit des peuples autochtones, le droit de l'environnement et le droit constitutionnel. Elle était boursière de la Fondation Trudeau en 2003. Et Dion Roméo Saganache, bonjour Roméo. Bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, euh, Roméo est ancien député fédéral représentant la circonscription d'Abitibi, Bay James, Nunavik et You, ancien vice-chef du Grand Conseil des Cris et ensuite leur directeur des relations avec le Québec et le monde. Parmi ses plusieurs chefs d'œuvre, euh, La paix des braves avec le chef Ted Moses, traité important entre les Cris et le Québec, et passage dans la Chambre des communes d'un projet de loi visant à harmoniser la législation canadienne avec la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. Roméo Saganache était mentor dans la Fondation Prudeau en 2005. Et à la suite de notre discussion, euh, Sébastien Brodeur-Girard nous offrira un commentaire. Bonjour Sébastien. Euh, Sébastien est avocat et professeur à l'École d'études autochtones de l'Université du Québec à Vitivitimiskaming, où il enseigne notamment le droit des peuples autochtones les enjeux contemporains autochtones. Entre autres, il était juriste et co-directeur de l'équipe de recherche au travail euh, de la Commission Bien à Québec. Alors, commençons avec, euh, avec toi, Roméo. Je voulais vous demander une question peut-être un peu bizarre, étant donné que ces discussions sont supposées examiner l'émergence canadienne de la pandémie. Mais est-ce qu'on est correct vraiment de cibler ce sujet quand on essaye de comprendre ce qui se passe dans les communautés autochtones à travers le pays Il me semble, en lisant, que l'essentiel aujourd'hui dans les communautés autochtones et parmi les chefs est plutôt une crise qui n'est pas nouvelle, racisme systémique, brutalité policière, etc. De quoi est-ce qu'on parle davantage dans des communautés ces jours en prenant un café de matin? <rire> C'est une bonne question. Euh, je pense qu'une des choses que euh, COVID-19 à, à, à montrer avec euh, beaucoup plus d'acuité, je dirais, c'est les inégalités et les iniquités que les peuples autochtones subissent depuis trop longtemps, à mon avis. Donc, euh, cela m'amène à penser que euh, déjà qu nous, que nous étions très en arrière de l'ensemble du Canada, euh, socio-économique, culturel euh, et autres, euh, on était très en arrière et malgré le fait que nous, avons, que nous sommes à peu près 5 de la population canadienne, nous recevons moins de 1 de l'aide financière qui provient pour, pour euh, aider les communautés autochtones. Donc, euh, cela va nous amener encore plus en arrière, à mon avis, lorsqu'on sortira éventuellement euh, de cette crise. C'est cet aspect-là qui, qui est très difficile dans les communautés autochtones. Euh, 
oublions la distanciation sociale quand tu habites dans une maison euh, avec 20 personnes et deux chambres. C'est impossible à faire. Euh, oublie le, euh, l'obligation de, de laver tes mains euh, continuellement, régulièrement, quand tu n'as pas d'eau potable dans la communauté. Donc, il y a tous ces éléments-là qui, euh, qui nous amènent, en tout cas nous, à penser que ce, ces, ces mesures de distanciation so- sociale, de ce lavage de mains ré- régulièrement, euh, est un dialogue de, pri- de, de privilégiés, ce que les communautés autochtones ne sont pas. Alors, c'est ça qui est, qui est difficile dans, dans tout ce, ce débat pour, pour nous dans, le, dans les communautés. Sophie, si on prend, euh, si on prend ces, euh, ce que Roméo dit comme point de lancement, il, il, il est facile d'imaginer au grand que le COVID nous touche par surprise soudainement de manière complètement nouvelle. Mais vous avez écrit par contre qu'il est essentiel de contextualiser la pandémie dans les formes de colonialisme qui prédisposent les communautés autochtones aux risques posés par ce virus. On pourrait évidemment parler pendant des heures et même des jours des années même, évidemment, mais pourrais-tu quand même nous introduire à ce contexte, euh, continuer à nous introduire à ce, à, à ce contexte? Oui, bien entendu. En fait, si on veut que la pandémie de COVID-19 puisse engendrer des changements véritablement transformateurs, véritablement durables, des changements justes, euh, il est essentiel de considérer la pandémie non pas comme un événement ponctuel, un événement isolé, euh, mais comme un événement s'inscrivant dans un contexte historique beaucoup plus vaste, marqué par diverses formes de colonialisme, de racisme et de discrimination systémique là, qui ont euh, déjà été euh, soulignées par euh, Roméo. Euh, ensemble de processus coloniaux qui euh, vont compromettre la santé et le bien-être des communautés autochtones et de leurs membres et donc les rendre davantage vulnérables ou poser des risques accrus dans le contexte de crise sanitaire comme la pandémie de COVID-19. Alors, je ne pourrais pas faire, euh, je pourrais pas raconter 400 ans d'histoire de colonialisme en quatre minutes, donc euh, ce serait extrêmement complexe, mais pour mentionner quelques exemples, celui qui vient d'emblée, euh, à l'esprit, ce sont bon, l'histoire des écoles résidentielles, l'histoire très récente, en fait, la dernière euh, ayant fermé ses portes en 1996. Donc, entre 1876 et 1996, ces écoles ont hébergé plus de 150 000 euh, enfants autochtones dans le but de les assimiler à la société coloniale, dans le but d'éradiquer les cultures autochtones, les langues autochtones. Euh, ces écoles étaient notoire, notoirement, telles qui étaient documentées par la Commission de vérité et de réconciliation mal gérée, sous-financée, mal entretenue. Euh, des milliers d'enfants autochtones euh, y ont vécu des violences euh, de toutes sortes. Plusieurs y ont laissé leur vie, y compris du fait de pandémie. Donc, les traumatismes intergénérationnels issus de l'histoire des euh, pensionnats, euh, bien entendu, affecte le bien-être de nombreux membres des communautés autochtones aujourd'hui et peut les rendre plus susceptibles aux complications liées à des crises sanitaires, notamment aux crises de la pandémie de COVID-19. Et envisager, en fait, la pandémie dans un contexte comme celui-là permet de comprendre des mesures très strictes, souvent plus strictes que les mesures fédérales et provinciales, que plusieurs communautés ont adopté pour protéger leurs membres et pour limiter la propagation du virus en leur sein. Je pense notamment à Kanakiskane Setaki, le chef Simon, qui a fermé les portes de la communauté au tiers pour protéger particulièrement les aînés qui sont très fragilisés par la pandémie de COVID-19, soulignant que les 60, qu'il voulait aussi protéger les 60 derniers locuteurs de la langue Mohawk au sein de la communauté. Alors, on voit ici les impacts accrus, mais aussi différenciés de la pandémie sur les communautés autochtones. Les écoles résidentielles s'inscrivent en outre au travers des nombreux processus historiques et contemporains par lesquels les peuples autochtones ont été et continuent d'être dépossédés de leurs terres, territoires euh, et euh, de leur euh, souveraineté. Euh, notamment aux fins de la mise en œuvre de grands projets de développement économique auxquels de nombreuses communautés autochtones participent que marginalement. Et ironiquement, alors qu'on tire des milliards de dollars de l'exploitation des territoires ancestraux des peuples autochtones, comme le mentionnait euh, très clairement Roméo, euh, les euh, peuples autochtones sont victimes de discrimination systémique de la part du gouvernement fédéral dans le financement et l'accès aux services de base que les Canadiens et les Canadiennes prennent 
tous pour euh, acquis, que ce soit l'accès à un logement suffisant, l'accès à l'eau potable, l'accès à l'éducation euh, et l'accès bon, aux services à l'enfance, euh, etc. Alors, à l'heure actuelle, pour donner, hein, Romy a donné déjà plusieurs exemples, mais quand on a 24 des logis au sein des euh, réserves qui sont surpeuplées, euh, il est très difficile de s'isoler physiquement ou de se confiner si on est atteint euh, du virus. Euh, la situation du logement, il faut le souligner, pose des enjeux particuliers pour les femmes autochtones et les enfants victimes de violences euh, domestiques, notamment lorsqu'on a euh, une insuffisance euh, de logements euh, sécuritaires au sein, euh, au sein des communautés. Euh, Roméo m'a mentionné également l'enjeu euh, de l'eau potable. Il y a encore 61 communautés des Premières Nations au Canada qui, ne, qui sont sous un avis euh, d'ébullition euh, à long terme, certains depuis plusieurs décennies. Donc, on leur demande au final de nettoyer leurs mains le plus souvent avec de l'eau contaminée. En somme, l'ensemble des processus coloniaux et des injustices systémiques vécues par les peuples autochtones ont compromis et continuent de compromettre la santé et le bien-être des peuples autochtones d'une manière qui les prédispose aux risques, euh, à des risques accrus et à des risques différenciés face à des pandémies. Romeo Saganache, Sophie a mentionné ici plusieurs décisions qui ont été prises par des communautés particulières pour protéger leur population euh, du virus. Euh, le monde au large fait face à d'énormes défis en luttant contre le virus, en, contre ce virus, mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut apprendre des décisions qui ont été prises par des communautés autochtones que tu connais ou que, que tu as vues pour nous aider à tourner la page? Je pense que Sophie a donné un des exemples qui était exemplaire, je pense, dans, dans les mesures prises. Il y a également les, au nord du Québec, chez les Cris, chez les Inuits, qui sont, les, je pense, les deux premières régions qui ont été fermées par leurs dirigeants. Euh, alors, euh, je dis bravo à ces, euh, à ces deux peuples. Euh, euh, D'ailleurs, le, le territoire CRI euh, continue d'être fermé au moment où on se parle. Ils ont pris cette décision-là. Cette table de coordination euh, pour la COVID-19 chez les CRI euh, est très rassemblable, euh, très précis dans ses, ses mesures et ses décisions, euh, de sorte que... Euh, la région euh, Bay James est encore fermée. Euh, cette table de coordination inclut le grand chef, le vice, la vice-grand chef, euh, la présidente la, du Conseil de la santé et des services sociaux de la Bay James, euh, la présidente de la commission scolaire CRI. Donc, tout ça est fait euh, <coughs> de façon coordonnée. Euh, C'est pour ça que les, les mesures qui sont prises sont, euh, sont assez larges et, et, <coughs> et complètes. complètes. Euh, le bon côté de, de, de cette fermeture, c'est que présentement, euh, depuis deux mois à peu près, c'est ce qu'on appelle chez les cris le « goose break ». Alors, tout, tout le monde, de toute façon, s'en allait sur le territoire, euh, ce qui est prévu par la Convention de la Bay James, premier traité moderne au pays. Euh, les cris ont institutionnalisé euh, leur, leur pratique traditionnelle euh, et ça inclut le, la chasse à l'outarde de, de printemps. Donc, toutes les écoles, toutes les écoles euh, ferment habituellement pendant ce temps-ci, euh, dans toutes les communautés. Et tous les enfants accompagnent leurs parents euh, sur le territoire pour cette chasse traditionnelle à l'outard. Alors, euh, ça tombait bien cette année pour ça. C'est la seule bonne raison que je trouve à dire de, de ce côté-là. Euh, mais autrement, euh, même la, la communauté CRI euh, donne des avis euh, trois fois par semaine euh, à l'ensemble de la population, à la radio. Euh, évidemment, avec les médias sociaux, ça facilite la tâche. Euh, donc, nous, nous, nous donne les, les régions qui sont à éviter pour nous. Alors, euh, c'est euh, très, euh, très complet comme, comme exercice à toutes les semaines, trois fois par semaine. Et j'en suis ravi de voir ça. Je pense que euh, ces mesures ont sauvé bien des vies dans les communautés clés au Québec. Est-ce que la fermeture de ces communautés durant si longtemps euh, a créé, d'après ce que tu vois, des changements dans les communautés eux-mêmes, d'une manière ou d'une autre? Euh, C'est-à-dire que ça, ça a rapproché à tout le moins les communautés autochtones et non autochtones dans la région de la Beijing. Euh, donc, en ne sortant pas, ils font la, 
dans l'épicerie, à Chibougamau, à Chapet, euh, etc. Donc, euh, à Matagami aussi. Euh, donc, euh, ça a rapproché un peu les, ces communautés-là parce que depuis quelques décennies, on a remarqué que les cris faisaient leur, euh, leur course à l'extérieur de la région, à Val d'Or, à Montréal. Euh, donc, euh, euh, donc, en fermant les, les frontières de la région, je pense que ça a permis un rapprochement de ce côté-là. On s'apprécie beaucoup plus, je pense. Euh, donc, dans ce sens-là, euh, c'est très positif. Euh, euh, pour, pour tout le monde dans, la, dans cette région, autant les cris que les non-cris de les jamais être comme ils se, se, se nomment. Sophie Thériault, euh, je vais finir ici avec un des chapitres qu'on a mentionné, euh, un, un, do, un, un don de, de Roméo pour, pour tout le Canada. Il était bien sûr responsable pour la réussite de l'adaptation par la Chambre de communes du projet de loi C-262 qui visait à harmoniser la législation canadienne avec la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones, un projet de loi qui commençait et mort au Sénat. Tu es jeune avocate de la prochaine génération. En préparant pour cette session, tu avais précisé que la pandémie témoigne de l'urgence de, de, de se mettre en main cette, ce, loi, ce, ce, ce projet de loi. Pourquoi J'aimerais bien d'ailleurs entendre Romeo sur cette question, donc je vais essayer de prendre un peu moins de temps. Alors, on a déjà parlé de l'ensemble des mesures qui ont été adoptées par plusieurs communautés autochtones à travers le pays pour protéger leur population. Euh, certaines communautés ont invoqué expressément, par exemple, la loi sur les Indiens, une loi coloniale, pour asseoir leur pouvoir. D'autres ont invoqué leur traité, mais plusieurs ont invoqué leur droit inhérent à l'autodétermination qui trouve son fondement dans les ordres juridiques autochtones et qui est également reconnu par la Déclaration des Nations unies. Euh, donc, si on se fie aux chiffres actuels, et Roméo l'a souligné, il semble bien que les mesures qui ont été adoptées par les communautés autochtones euh, ont été efficaces euh, pour éviter la propagation du virus au sein de ces communautés et pour reprendre euh, un texte récent euh, des auteurs autochtones, Amy Craft, Deborah McGregor, Jeffrey Ewitt. Euh, C'est peut-être, en fait, euh, parce que les communautés autochtones euh, sont les mieux placées pour comprendre quels sont les besoins, quelles sont les situations particulières de leur communauté qui euh, est la manière de répondre donc à cette, euh, à cette situation. Alors, il faut être clair, je pense qu'il est important de souligner que les peuples autochtones n'ont pas besoin de l'État pour affirmer et pour appliquer leurs droits, euh, leurs juridictions inhérentes sur leur territoire, euh, leur territoire ancestral. Ils peuvent pour se faire s'appuyer sur leur propre ordre juridique qui précède l'État canadien. En revanche, euh, L'absence de reconnaissance par l'État des juridictions inhérentes des peuples autochtones sur le territoire peut être particulièrement problématique lorsque l'État impose de manière unilatérale des mesures ou des décisions qui sont incompatibles avec les mesures ou les décisions que les peuples autochtones veulent mettre en œuvre sur le territoire. Euh, on a vu dans le contexte de la COVID-19 euh, de nombreux conflits qui ont posé des communautés autochtones à, à l'État et à des industries, euh, notamment euh, aux, euh, à des provinces, euh, dans le contexte des mesures de confinement, mais aussi de la mise en œuvre de plans de déconfinement, par exemple, lorsque des provinces sont déclarées comme étant des secteurs comme les mines, euh, le pétrole, euh, voire la chasse et la pêche sportive, sans se coordonner au préalable avec les communautés autochtones les plus susceptibles d'être touchées par l'arrivée massive de travailleurs provenant des centres urbains, euh, un roulement donc de travailleurs susceptibles d'apporter la COVID dans, euh, des, euh, dans des communautés. Alors, la mise en œuvre de la Déclaration des Nations unies au Canada parce qu'elle comporte plusieurs droits qui, bon, le droit à l'autodétermination et plusieurs droits qui s'y rattachent. On peut penser au droit de définir et d'établir des priorités, des stratégies en matière d'utilisation des territoires autochtones, le droit au consentement préalable, libre et éclairé. Donc, euh, la mise en œuvre de la déclaration permettrait de renforcer la capacité des peuples autochtones de mettre en application leurs juridictions et leurs ordres juridiques sur leur territoire traditionnel et en assurer le respect tant par l'État que pour les tiers. Mais si je peux laisser une minute à Roméo pour, pour commenter, parce que c'est quand même son... Oui. Euh, ce que je pourrais rajouter à tout ça, c'est que euh, je, je ne sais pas exactement ce que le gouvernement canadien a l'intention de faire maintenant avec la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. Ils ont promis quelque chose, 
euh, au-delà de ce que j'avais proposé en Chambre et accepté par, par le Parlement canadien, euh, qu'est-ce qu'ils vont faire et quand vont-ils le faire? C'est des grandes questions qui, qui demeurent. Cependant, ce que le projet de loi C262, la loi C262 euh, venait faire, c'est uniquement confirmer que la déclaration a, a application en droit domestique canadien. Euh, il s'agit de la respecter, de la mettre en œuvre, euh, parce que la déclaration s'applique comme tous les autres instruments en droit international. Euh, la déclaration s'applique au Canada déjà. Euh, okay. Mon projet de loi ne visait qu'à confirmer cet état de droit. Euh, donc, euh, euh, je m'attends à ce qu'on bouge, qu bouge rapidement là-dessus. On me dit euh, par certains députés qu'ils euh, sont en train de le travailler. Euh, mais en tout cas, euh, je pense qu'il y a une urgence euh, ici à euh, adopter un, un projet de loi gouvernemental cette fois-ci, parce que les règles, une fois rendues au Sénat, seront différents par rapport à un projet de loi privé. Euh, C'est ça qui, est, qui a été euh, difficile dans mon, dans mon cas, parce que c'était un projet de loi privé. Euh, donc, euh, euh, ce ne pas les mêmes règles qui s'appliquent euh, euh, au Sénat. Et C'est ce qui a permis à ces cinq euh, sénateurs conservateurs euh, de mettre fin à ce projet de loi. Passons alors euh, à Sébastien. Euh, vos réactions, Sébastien oui, euh, ben, écoutez, je vais, je vais être bref euh, parce que euh, le, le temps file, mais et, et on a déjà, nos, nos deux panélistes ont déjà vraiment couvert euh, les, les grands enjeux liés à cette question-là, dont on pourrait parler pendant des heures, parce que ce que je voudrais souligner en particulier, c'est la grande diversité des situations euh, dans, dans le monde autochtone et donc des, réda des réactions qui sont adaptées à, à tous ces besoins particuliers-là. Alors, parce qu'il n'y a pas moyen d'avoir une réponse puis d'essayer de caractériser euh, une situation, il faut vraiment tenir compte de chaque, chaque cas particulier. Et, euh, et Roméo a déjà euh, donc, euh, mentionné la, la, la situation en IOSG, comment ça a été géré par le gouvernement de la Nation Cree et les différentes communautés. Il euh, y, y a même une loi qui a été adoptée, la Mandatory Self-Isolation Law, euh, et je trouvais intéressant la citation de, de Paul John Murdoch à ce niveau-là, qui est avocat et secrétaire pour le gouvernement de la Nation Cri, qui dit « On a adopté nos propres lois parce que nous étions préoccupés par les lois qui venaient du gouvernement du Québec. Elles ne faisaient pas forcément de sens pour nous et parfois étaient contradictoires. » Donc, il y a vraiment eu une prise en charge à ce moment-là, euh, y compris au niveau législatif euh, de, de, de toute euh, la gestion de cette crise de pandémie. Et euh, la même chose s'est produite dans une communauté pas très loin d'où je suis, euh, à Val-d'Or, donc au Témiscamingue, la Long Point euh, First Nation, une communauté à Anishinaabe de, de Winway, qui, contrairement euh, aux euh, au cris, euh, jouit de beaucoup moins de, mo de moyens, euh, ont pris les, a décidé de, de, de s'isoler aussi, de vouloir faire respecter justement une... Un, un, de, de, de pouvoir euh, bien contrôler tout ce qui se passe dans la communauté, mais ils se sont fait couper les services, les financements pour les services policiers il y a plus d'une dizaine d'années. Donc, ça, ça, ça pose des enjeux logistiques autrement plus complexes. Euh, il a fallu que euh, cette communauté-là ait cherché de la nourriture pour l'ensemble de la communauté qui a été gérée euh, pendant, pour avoir des stocks pendant plusieurs semaines pour s'assurer que tout le monde soit ravitaillé. Donc, malgré des, des conditions très différentes, ils ont su répondre à travers. Je sais qu'on a dit qu'il y avait plus, en l'espace de, de deux mois, ils ont fait plus de 90 rencontres, justement, de leur comité euh, de, de, de gestion de la pandémie pour trouver des solutions adaptées à leurs besoins. Donc, ça s'est vraiment fait de manière très, très efficace malgré tout, donc malgré la diversité des moyens. Malgré toutes ces différences-là, il y a une particularité, je pense, qui unit les, 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 les communautés autochtones face à la pandémie, puis c'est le peu de réponse de l'État à leurs besoins. Euh, il y a de l'argent qui, euh, qui est venu d'Ottawa, mais Roméo l'a mentionné que ce n'était pas suffisant pour répondre, certainement pas pour répondre aux besoins en temps normal et, et certainement pas en temps de crise en particulier. Et, euh, et peu de sensibilité à s'adapter à toutes ces situations particulières-là que, que je viens de nommer. Au début, il y a même eu justement des... On a voulu forcer les élections qui étaient prévues selon la loi sur les Indiens à se tenir malgré tout. Alors, on voit qu'il y, qu y a un manque de sensibilité à ce niveau-là. Des, des sites miniers qui ont, qui ont réouvert dans le Nord sans la consultation puis l'accord des communautés. Actuellement, on nous navigue qu'il y a... On sait qu'il y a des, des, je dirais pas des pressions, mais une volonté de rouvrir la cour itinérante 
malgré le, la demande des autorités locales de continuer le confinement tant que la situation n'est pas stabilisée. Donc, euh, il y a, il y a, on a parlé de discrimination systémique qui continue à s'exprimer de cette manière-là. Il y a, il y a un, une difficulté à prendre en compte toutes ces particularités-là du, du monde autochtone. Mais je voudrais conclure vraiment en, en, en rappelant ces, ce qu'on peut appeler, je pense, une démonstration spectaculaire de la, de, la, de la capacité de gouvernance des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis dans, dans cette situation-là. Et, et je crois qu'il y a des leçons euh, pour tout le monde à, à tirer de ça. Euh, nos gouvernements provinciaux euh, fédéral ont, tendance à, ont eu tendance à réagir à face à la crise, euh, essayaient de, de s'adapter au fur et à mesure. Alors que si on prend, moi j'aime bien le, le, le terme en Inu pour parler de gouvernance qui est utilisé, Takwaigan, qui veut dire « gouvernail ». Donc, c'est donner une direction, c'est ça la, la véritable gouvernance, donc pas être mené par les événements, mais vraiment diriger la situation. Et si on s'inspire de, 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 de la vision du leadership dans le monde autochtone, qui est partagé par la grande majorité des nations, je pense au Canada, c'est n'est pas d'asseoir son leadership sur l'autorité, mais d'être un modèle. Et donc, cette capacité-là, je pense, des communautés autochtones à être un modèle à, à suivre, euh, devrait inspirer l'ensemble de la société canadienne à travers tout ce qu'on a pu voir euh, depuis euh, quelques, plusieurs semaines. Je vous remercie, je vous remercie Sébastien, Sophie, Roméo. Euh, histoire complexe, évidemment, présent, complexe également, mais surtout, en vous entendant tout, une histoire de, de courage et de leadership autochtone. Et alors, euh, je le reçois comme invitation à regagner ce sentier commun qu'on avait avant.